Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Roll Call by Jerry and Sharon Ahern Rain filled his mouth and he tilted his head back slightly so the natural gutters formed by the brim of his hat would flush the water back. The overlining of his canvas poncho was worn, mostly over the shoulders, and his uniform tunic was dampening there more and more as the rain drove down still harder. There were sheets of the rain, black as the ink, except for the gold shadows, where a sheltered lamp made its reflection. The rain so solid, a wall that the icy cold water held the light, forcing it back. The three lamps that still functioned were shielded behind shelter halves so that their meager light could only be seen from the river, if at all, but not from the road. On the other side of the river, across a bridge that gave him shivers when he looked at it, there was still freedom, yet for how much longer he was afraid to guess. The bridge was well downstream from where he stood, and here on this side of the usually quiet, meandering little river, which almost but not quite marked the border between Georgia and Tennessee, it was just south and east of the actual line, according to the maps. Union troops were the only ones who were free, free to loot and ransack, and only God knew what else. Preston Hollings had lived north, gone to school there, and he knew that some of the things folks said about the Yankees were lies, lies born out of fear and dread. But he knew soldiers, too, and these men whom the 10th Georgia militia had fought throughout the day and long and hard into the night were hardened campaigners, men whom blood and death had numbed to their own humanity. There was no sniper fire, and the rain's heaviness was a blessing that way. Even one of the forty-five caliber Whitworth rifles, which some southern boys claim could reach out accurately to better than a thousand yards, would have been hard-pressed to find its mark tonight, with the visibility so bad and the walls of water in between so unremitting. Lieutenant Hollings? Hollings had been watching the bridge for quite some time, walked down river along the bank to where it was impossible to continue because the bank was flooded over. He walked up river, then the quarter mile or so toward the camp, but there was nowhere to cross but the bridge, no answer but the bridge. When he heard his name called, he turned around too quickly, and water poured down from his hat for his trouble, bathing his face and running down under the neck of his poncho and soaking the front of the Lindsay Woolsey shirt he wore beneath his tunic. The face under the beak of the cabby belonged to Platoon Sergeant Rollins. A good face, broad and generous, character lines etched into it by hardship and anguish. Tonight, like all the faces, when faces could be seen at all in some stray shaft of lamplight, Rollins' face was a mask of exhaustion and despair. But there was none of that in his voice. Captain Sterrett requests that you all join him in his tent, Lieutenant. Rollins saluted, and Hollings returned it. Rollins logging off through the clay and mud and into the night, evidently on some other errand or another for the captain. Hollings took one more look downstream toward the bridge, then tucked the muzzle of his rifle more closely against his side beneath the poncho. The rifle was a suave carbine he picked up on the battlefield today. His own privately purchased Henry Repeater lost along with all the rest of his gear, even the letter from Molly, when his horse was shut out from under him early in the afternoon. Hollings' right knee was still a little stiff, but there was nothing broken, no permanent damage. He'd gotten far enough along in school to know that at least. The ground, so saturated with rain that every depression was a pool, sucked at his feet as he left the bridge and started across their encampment. He couldn't even see the pickets, but told himself they were still out there, 
and he could no longer see the road. The road. It wasn't much of a road, not much of a road at all. It was wide enough for a carriage of the kind which a beautifully dressed lady might ride, or the kind which drew an artillery piece. There were no ladies tonight, and the tenth one piece of Yankee ordnance got mired in the mud and was abandoned, but not before Rollins, and he had packed the muzzle hard in little long fuse, wringing the piece and blowing it off the mounts. The road cut off by some of Sherman's men, about a hundred or so infantry and two score of cavalry, was the only way out. Holling stepped the wrong way, his right boot heel slipping, and he went down, into a puddle deep as a shell hole, pushing his rifle clear of it so rapidly almost threw his right arm out of the shoulder socket. He scrambled up and out, onto his knees, the lower half of his body soaked through. Hollings patted at the holster for his belt pistol, grateful once again for the Smith & Wesson's waterproof metallic cartridges, and to the dead Yankee officer who'd supplied the revolver. As he stood up, the knee he twisted when his horse was put down from under him gave him a twinge of pain. But by using the butt of the suave and grasping the muzzle, and like a cane, he was able to stand. The gun's action was doused beyond redemption now and would have to be emptied and cleaned before firing. He resumed, boots awash with muddy water, his already wet stockings wetter, walking toward Captain Sterrett's tent. When the rain let up, or when the dawn came, whichever occurred first, the Union cavalry would cut through their camp, and the Union infantry would be right on their horses' heels. Eight horses remained in the camp tonight. The ninth, the beast stepped in one of the water-filled holes and broke off its hind legs clean through to where the bone protruded, butchered so the men would have something to eat. The cook fire, nearly out now, is just visible as glowing red embers. Some of the men huddled around it for its meager warmth against the unseasonably chilly night. The fire had been built on a broad flat rock which rose several feet above the banks of the river, but well below where the ground dropped off and hence safe enough against attracting enemy fire. In the reddish glow, Hollings could see the water, risen well over two feet from earlier, churning fierce and fast and white along the bank. At midstream, the water would be moving so fast no horse or man could swim it, and the bridge, the bridge he'd been watching for an hour at least, would not hold against it much longer. The bridge was a trestle, not very high, but not very sturdy either, its wooden braces creaking audibly, like old men's voices in the night. Sometimes, like old men too, it shook. The nurse's face was prettier than he'd remembered it being. Mr. Hollings, if he said something to her, maybe he could close his eyes again. Maybe she would go away. Now, yeah. Mr. Hollings. The lady from the Daughters of the Confederacy is here. She said you promised to talk to her today, when she came last week. He closed his eyes, hoping the nurse would think he drifted off again. But in his mind's eye, he saw the very earnest face of the pretty young woman from the Daughters of the Confederacy. Research, she said. She was doing research on the 10th Georgia Militia, and he was the only man surviving. He knew that right enough. And it was this young woman, Mrs. Mary Elizabeth Hubbard, who started him thinking about things again after all these years, after meeting up with that Illinois corporal who was in Crook's outfit there past the North Platte along Rosebud Creek, and talking with him about the night back in 64. Preston Hollings vowed never to think about that night again. Hollings could see the wrinkled up, freckled face even now when he closed his eyes really tight. And after a while, he could hear the terrifyingly punctuated night stillness. The red-skinned men who killed George Custer were still out there, and even the wild things were afraid to speak when the Sioux called back and forth like wolves and prairie dogs. It was the 4th of July, and the country was 100 years old, and there were lots of men wearing blue who used to wear gray. You say strange things on guard duty. Get close to a man in the darkness whom in daylight 
you wouldn't get close to at all. Let someone inside you because it's even darker in there than the night that surrounds you. Officer, wasn't you? Hollywood looked down at his sleeve, and even though he couldn't see the two stripes, he could feel them without touching them. Wasn't much to do at home, Jim. Either join up or fight Indians, or sit on the porch rocking until some Yankee banker comes along with the sheriff and some blue bellies backing them, all up to tell a man he doesn't own the porch anymore, or the rocking chair for that matter. Jim Bodkin had just been shipped west after four years in the east, just missed being assigned to the 7th, and maybe being one of the 215 men Crazy Horse massacred at Little Bighorn. Crazy thing, ain't it? You and me? What? I mean, reckon after all the men got themselves killed back there that night in Tennessee. It was Georgia, Jim. Bodkid grunted something, spat some juice from his jaw, and readjusted the way he hugged his rifle, then leaned back against the wagon. They had drawn guard duty together three times now. And the first night now, a night like this, the air so still it clung to you like a shroud. They'd realized they'd fought together in the same battle, but on different sides, twelve years before. Hollings hadn't asked, but each time he ended up tour with Bodkin, he had promised himself to draw up the courage and bring it up. Tonight it just happened. When the old unit got hit by our boys, what happened? What happened? Hell. You Johnny Rebs took us all by surprise, you did. You just kept up coming no matter wise how damn many we'd shoot. There was always more, you. There was. Never seen no soldiers in my life was braver, and I'll be giving you that. So it had happened. Mr. Hollings. Different voice, but a woman. Blurry. A little, and after a blink or two, not that blurry at all. Pretty face, by throat. Ma'am. He realized suddenly that his chest was showing, and after all, she was a gentle lady. Forgive me, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Hollings, maybe I should come back another day, sir. You all seem tired. He tried to sit up, succeeded in raising one shoulder. It's a genuine pleasure, ma'am. You all and you all ladies do fine work. Keeping memories alive, ma'am. It's men like you, Mr. Hollings, who make our labors a pleasure, sir. It's all too kind, Miss Hubbard, ma'am. It was First Lieutenant Hollings, wasn't it, sir, of the 10th Georgia Militia? I sometimes wondered if all the gallant men of the South came together for one moment of history. She had a lovely smile, lovelier when she talked, because her eyes were so bright and full of wonder and interest, like a child's eyes. It was called the Battle of Bugle Ford. What I wanted to ask you all something about Mr. Hollings? He felt himself starting to laugh, remembering suddenly that he hadn't laughed for a long time, and it was a good feeling, despite the pain in his left arm that started like a toothache and radiated upwards. He held his arm out, but said nothing about the pain. Why? Y'all's laughing at me. And her smile broadened, and she pushed a lock of hair away from her forehead with the back of her hand, just the way Molly always had. Her forehead glistened slightly. It had been a warm summer. He'd heard some of the new boys complaining about it sometimes, when they wheeled him into the recreation hall. And then he thought about the gas they were using in Europe, and he felt like crying instead. Mr. Hollings? How's that young soldier? Young soldier? There was genuine amusement in her eyes, and then suddenly her eyes went a little hard, and she looked away. He remembered now. The boy with the burned-out lungs died a week ago, a day ago, an hour ago, but dead regardless. I fought with old Teddy, you all know, down Cuba way, was a sergeant major. That's where I lost my leg, ma'am. And Preston Hollings felt sudden embarrassment because he'd made a direct reference to a portion of his anatomy in front of a lady. He charted off to old age. He was born in 1840, and here it was, 1917, or was it 1918? He could have asked Mrs. Hubbard, of course, and she would have told him, but Hollings didn't bother. Did you always want to be a soldier, Mr. Hollings? No, ma'am. I wanted to be a doctor, and my family sent me north to study. In 1859 it was. But then, 
There was always a talk about slavery in the smoky hours near twilight, and he never defended it because he never believed that a man was anything less than a man because his skin was dark, or anything more than any other man because he said he was an abolitionist. After a while, he'd walk the commons by himself rather than sit on porches with empty-headed boys who knew nothing about what lay in store for them. Somehow, and he didn't know why, he had always known. Then word of Lincoln's election came and of South Carolina leaving the Union, and he went to Professor Masterson and told him, I am afraid, sir, that responsibility to my house must come before the pursuance of a medical career. I would expect no less of you, Mr. Hollings, but you would make a fine surgeon, the speed with which you can act, the deafness of your touch. I see that in few young men, Mr. Hollings. It is a gift. Do not throw it away. He promised Dr. Masterson he would not throw it away. Jim Bodkin was pumping blood all around the arrow shaft. Bloody pink drool dribbling down from the left corner of his mouth and oozing through the wide gaps between the dozen or so brown teeth in the lower half of his jaw. Holling's useless single-shot rifle was jammed and his Colt revolver was empty. As he knelt beside Bodkin, he took the old Smith & Wesson, Model 2 Army from under his blouse, stabbing it toward the Indian who'd shot Jim Bodkin through pulling the trigger, cocking the hammer, pulling the trigger again. The Sioux warrior rawhide thongs wound through his braids, iron jaw set hard over the bear claw necklace round the neck with stretched taut tendons, face painted, skin gleaming sweat over muscles that Michelangelo could have used to model David, fell over dead with a cry. Their horses' hooves throwing up a wake of turf Two of the other soldiers from the foraging party came over the rise and opened fire on the remaining Sioux warriors, Colt revolvers belching tongues of orange flame and great puffs of gray smoke. The other three Indians returned fire, two of them with Winchester repeating rifles that were better and faster than anything the army could afford, the other with a bow and arrows. One of the ones with a Winchester fell and Holling shouted to Jim Bodkin, I'll be back, Jim, and he ran toward the fallen Sioux working the lever of the modern Winchester, just like the lever of the old Henry he'd lost in the war, snapping it to his shoulder, twitching back the trigger and watching one of the red men fall. God damn it. He stood there, the two of his boys. My God, blue bellies were his boys, riding after the two Indians. The rifle hot to the touch of the barrel, he set it down as he returned to Jim Bodkin's side. Jim opened his eyes. I gotta, gotta, Jim, what? Yo, Bodkin, James T., sir. Jim's eyes never closed, except under Preston Hollings' fingers. Mr. Hollings? Ma'am? I said, Why were you all laughing before, Mr. Hollings? He remembered. Bugle Ford is the name you all gave it, ma'am. We call that old River Fork the Cherokee Wife, ma'am. There wasn't any Bugle Ford or anything like that back then. How many men were on the bridge when it went down? Do you all remember? Asking him if he remembered that night was like asking him if he remembered his name. Lieutenant Hollings reporting, sir. Captain Sturette looked up from the wash of candlelight which made the yellow surface of the map he studied look somehow yellower. At ease, Lieutenant. Captain Sturette wasn't the sort of man who looked to be a natural leader, but he was. His face was puffy-looking in the cheeks, his eyes smallish and pale, a watery blue and shoulders sloping almost as much as a woman's would, and his size not imposing. He was tall, but almost wraith thin. Sit down, Press. Thank you, sir. Hollings pulled the emptied, upended powder keg a little away from the tent wall, taking off his hat, more rainwater washing down inside his poncho. Drink, Tennessee whiskey, best there is. Thank you, sir. Hollings took the offered bottle and took a short swallow, never having developed much of a taste for liquor, but it was hot going down, and his insides were cold. Sherman's going to reach Atlanta, press. I feel it in my bones, but that doesn't mean we ain't going to try and stop him. Hollings didn't know what to say. He handed back the bottle, and Captain Sturette took a swallow. 
The captain's Adam's apple bobbing crazily in his skinny neck as the whiskey went down. Amos Durrett had been a dentist and his family owned fields of Elijah, acre upon acre of cotton and timber, sawmills and granaries, a teamstering business that carried goods all up and down through the mountains, through the Carolinas and Tennessee, and sometimes all the way over into Birmingham on the other side of the Alabama line. He'd raised the company himself, as was the usual thing, the boys all volunteers, the officers elected. Captain Sturette, the hands-down choice, not just because he paid for the rifles and the uniforms and the horses and provisions, but because he was a Misturette, a man other men counted on. Most of his slaves had been freed years before the war, except the ones too old to find homes and work, or the ones who wanted to stay on to look after aging parents. And Hollings thought about the boys up at college, how a Misturette didn't fit their preconceptions. That road is our only way out, unless you all think that a bridge will take us. No, sir, I think it would collapse. Then we are surely doomed to press. Surrender was out of the question, and if Captain Sturette were right about Atlanta, every man who could be saved would be needed to fight, and then some day to rebuild. I have been thinking, Captain, and one man might be able to make it across. Captain, I am a good swimmer, if it comes to that, sir, and there must be units of our boys nearby on the other side of the river. If I could find such a unit, then we could counterattack the Union force along its western flank. That could gain us enough advantage so there would be time to get down the road and out. The road narrows through the rocky pass about two miles to the west. A handful of men could cover withdrawal there, then use what powder we have to block the road with rock slide. The Union infantry could scrabble over the rocks for certain, but the Union cavalry would be cut off from pursuing our boys, sir. I agree, Press, that there certainly must be plenty of our lads on the other side of this damnable river, and y'all's plan is a good one, but it hinges upon a man being able to get across that confounded bridge. I've been helping my family build things at Fields of Elijah since I was old enough for one of the men to show me which end of the mallet was used to hit which end of the peg. And I know that old bridge is going to collapse. First time somebody sets a foot on it there near the middle. The underpinnings are all washed out where they were shored up with dirt and rock. That dirt and rock is gone. The water's just carrying them away, press. Captain Sturette struck fire from a tinderbox, putting the flame deep within the bowl of his pipe. Tobacco was something that Captain hadn't had for many weeks, and the smoke from his pipe smelled like burning leaves, because that was all it was. And he looked across the bowl of his pipe, pale eyes squinting against the smoke when he said, Carry you all away, that water will, to you all's death, sure as I know, press. If no one crosses that bridge, we are done for sure, sir. Sturette nodded soberly. Yalls is a valuable officer, lieutenant. That young subaltern, Mr. Carruthers, is sincere but not very adept. Although you all might be too charitable to agree to that openly. In y'all's in her thoughts, the conclusion is obvious. Captain Sturette, sir, if we are agreed that someone must try to cross the river, then I am, sir, the logical choice. I have no wounds to inhibit me physically. Hollings had been careful about not limping on his right knee when he entered the tent, keeping the legs stretched out now so he would be able to arise without calling attention to it. And many of our boys do not swim a single stroke, sir. As an officer, I'm more likely to be able to rouse support on the other side of the river, more so than an ordinary soldier of any sort. I know the countryside to a degree, so there is little chance that I will wander off in the wrong direction, waste invaluable time and energy. I am Captain Sturette, the logical man to undertake this mission. Captain Amos Sturette leaned forward with his map, the smoke from his pipe and the candle mingling as they drifted upward into the gray clouds already clinging in the shadows above the yellow light. I will not deny you all this chance to save the men of our company, Lieutenant, and I shall read my Bible for y'all's safe return. And should that not occur? 
then I will make every effort to inform the Hollings family how bravely their son died in the service of our cause. The interview was over. Preston Hollings stood, a stab of pain in his right knee, but he dropped his hat, bending over to recover the sodden headgear and mask in difficulty with which he fully straightened his leg. He redonned his hat. Captain Sturette saluted him. Mr. Hollings. He turned his head, pain and stiffness in the left side of his neck. Sir, I can come back another day if you all's all feeling tired. I thoroughly enjoy you all's company, ma'am, if I may be so bold. She smiled, a smile of genuine warmth, and again she made that gesture. The gesture that Molly had made so often gently nudging away a lock of silken hair with the back of her hand. She brushed back a lock of her dark hair. Her eyes were brighter blue than a clear sky on a windy morning. Long lash lids fluttering downward like the wings of summer butterflies. Her cheeks flushing, yet her soft smooth skin white and cool like marble against his fingertips. It ain't right. It certainly ain't right, Preston Hollings, that a man who is almost a doctor of medicine should be going off the lot knows what carrying some silly gun. And I love you all so hard it hurts. She leaned her head against his chest. In the arbor, the strong scents of the honeysuckle beyond and the roses within, whereas nothing. It was supposed to be evil to think of it, he knew, but they were as nothing to the heady scent of her as he bent his face and placed his lips to her bare shoulder, and she trembled beneath his touch. Her body seemed to melt and remold itself against him. Press, and he felt a tear as it fell from her eye against his hand. Everyone is telling us that the world will not last long, Molly, and it's every southern boy has a girl one-tenth as beautiful as y'all waiting at home for him. The Union boys won't have a chance against us. Preston Hollings believed the opposite of his words, of course, not about Molly's considerable charms, but about the war. Northern boys had sweethearts waiting for them, too, and the vast industrial power of the North was a weapon no amount of southern valor could in the long term stand against. His father had once told him, though, that a man did what he had to do, could do no less, regardless of the cost. That summed up this war. He had known that before the first shot was fired at Fort Sumter, known that his world was about to end forever. You almost swear to me, Preston Hollings, that you will come back and make a good Christian woman out of me. I swear, Hollings whispered, daring to kiss her lips. He had kissed her like that before many times, but never quite like that. And never would he do so again. Molly died of a fever. Who was Molly, Mr. Hollings? He flexed the fingers of his left hand against the growing stiffness. She was why I tried crossing that. He almost used profanity in front of a woman, but he caught himself, saying instead, the God-forsaken bridge, ma'am. But had God forsaken the bridge, or had God merely taken more active control of his destiny than he had ever imagined possible? His left hand began to shake violently, and no matter how hard he tried, he could not stop it from shaking. Preston Hollings could not be sure about the bridge except that what had happened had really happened, but he felt deep within him that soon, very soon now, he would know. He could not stop the shaking. It shook violently, the bridge. It rattled and shook and pulsed. The trembling so pronounced for long moments had a stretch that he was almost certain that the bridge would collapse and be washed away down the river and into oblivion before he could even set foot upon it. But the bridge merely waited, warning him not to tempt it, daring him to try. Lieutenant Hollings, sir, you all's going to get pitched into that old river for certain sure. Hollings forced a smile as he looked over at Rollins. Y'all might just have a talent for predicting the future, Tom. Begging the lieutenant's pardon, sir, but I reckon it wouldn't hurt none if I was to. Try it? Preston Hollings couldn't see Tom Rollins' face, but he knew the look that would be there, an earnest smile. Sergeant, y'all outweigh me by fifty pounds, if it's an ounce. And that was my damn fool idea, anyway. Rawlings said nothing. Thunder had begun rumbling heavily through the sky, so loud it was like the roar of cannon fire. 
and there were occasional brilliant flashes of lightning. In those flashes, he had watched the bridge. Now he watched Tom Rawlings' face. It was as he had predicted it would be. Well-meaning, full of friendship and concern. There was a clap of thunder, so loud that Hollings' ears rang with a sound. Hollings had given over the rifle to Corporal Scoggins. The rifle's fate did not matter to him, and was too heavy to take along. He would need both hands along the bridge rail, and should the structure collapse with him on it, both hands to hold on. He could have slung the rifle over his shoulder, but that would only be extra weight with which to deal should he be thrown into the current and be forced to swim for his life. The weapon he removed now, for however, was of considerable value to him. Take my saber, Tom. If I should not return, and it is within y'all's power to do so, I would appreciate it being given to Miss Molly Abercrombie, the daughter of Mr. Titus Abercrombie of Stonewood. Yes, sir, but there was a flash of lightning, and Hollings knew that Rawlings would be able to see his face, so he merely shook his head as he placed the saber into the platoon sergeant's open hands. Hollings drew the Smith & Wesson, inverted the revolver first, and broke it open at the latch where barrel met frame. Six cartridges were loaded, and there were twenty more in a drawstring bag secured inside his uniform. As if somehow he and the bridge were actors in a stage play, Lightning flashed and the bridge took its cue when he stared at it once again, twisting and rolling, yet still standing. As soon as I am across, Sergeant, informed Captain Sturette, should I fail in my attempt, please inform the Captain of that as well. Lightning flashed again and Hollings saw Tom Rollins clearly in its glow. The saber shifted to his left hand, his right hand extended. Hollings clasped hands with the older man. Then Rollins stepped back, saluting. Hollings returned the salute as smartly as he could. Hollings looked at the bridge. There was no lightning to cue his adversary this time. Thunder rumbled round about them, sounding somehow as though time and the world were being ripped asunder. Preston Hollings took his watch from its pocket, already knowing the approximate time, but checking that it was wound tight, he replaced the watch securely. Lightning flash. The bridge takes its cue. He set foot on the nearest hole board and the bridge twisted and vibrated, repelling him. He took a step further. Between the sounds of the thunder, there was a sound more familiar, a human voice, a cry of warning. Hollings turned his head in time to see Tom Rawlings stepping back as a dark shape lunged out of the trees. A soldier, a rifle, a fixed bayonet, a shot, a miss. Rawlings' lament, belt pistol, spoke with authority. Not one of the eight forty-one caliber balls from the revolver cylinder, but the twenty-gauge shotgun barrel beneath. But there was only light, no sound of the shot audible above the thunderclaps, which came now one after the other. The soldier, all uniforms, would be darkened to the same color with rain, had to be Union. And where there was one, Hollings jumped from the bridge to the embankment, nearly losing his balance coming down hard his right knee, twisting, but holding. More man-shapes came from the trees on the downstream side of the bridge, infiltrators perhaps looking for a live prisoner to interrogate, perhaps intent on demoralizing the enemy with close-range harassing fire. There was no further time to consider motivation. The Smith & Wesson revolver was already out of its holster and clenched tightly in his right fist. Hollings fired from the hip, not knowing where he hit the Union soldier, when a four now visible, but certain that he had hit him. The man stumbled back, rifle flying from his hands, hands clasping his left breast, face turned down toward his hands, mouth moving as though he were shouting, but the thunder rumbled continuously now, and not even the sound of the shot from the pistol in his own hand that Preston Hollings heard. One of the three northern boys Still standing, charged towards him, Hollings fired and missed. But the Union soldier slipped in the Georgia mud, sprawling across it, sliding toward the bridge. There was no time to shoot at him again. Lightning flashed continuously. Hollings wheeled left just in time to see Tom Rollins take a Union bayonet square through the chest in the same instant as Rollins fired his revolver into his killer's neck. Blood sprayed from the Union soldier's neck, that an artery was struck clear from its volume and force. Tom and the Union boy collapsed into each other's arms like lovers embracing. 
the last of the Union soldiers still on his feet, brought his rifle to his shoulder, the yawning cavern that was its muscle pointed at Hollings' chest. Hollings fired to Smith and Wesson from shoulder level at extended arm's length, like a duelist in a romantic novel, then fired it again. The Union boy plunged to his knees, a tree chopped through in woods too dense, would fall this way, just dropping the perfect balance point attained. The dead soldier didn't move again. It was clear that Tom Rollins was dead, the point of the Union soldier bayonet protruding from his back so it could have sent between the shoulder blades that it could have done nothing but sever the spine. Then Hollings remembered the Union boy who had gone sprawling into the mud and turned so quickly back toward the bridge that his knee nearly went out from under him. The Union boy was gone from sight. Perhaps the infiltrator had slid all the way over the embankment and into the swirling waters of the river. Smith and Wesson revolver clenched tight in his fist. Hollings started towards the bridge. Lightning seemed to swirl around him. The night was bright as noon. Yet the sound of thunder, curiously, was now abated, wind rushing loudly. But somehow he could still hear the smallest sounds, the bridge creaking and the water roaring beneath it, battering the trembling supports. It seemed reasonable to conclude that the Union party was only those men he had seen here by the bridge, no more, and therefore there was no immediate danger to the camp. If he delayed now, ran back the half mile or so and informed Captain Sturet about what had transpired, by the time he would be able to return to the bridge, the bridge would be out. All hope of finding any means by which to counter attack and thus save the men of the 10th Georgia would be dashed. Preston Hollings holstered his revolver and set foot upon the bridge, and as he did so, he heard two sounds almost simultaneously, both striking fear into his heart, the sound of one of the boards which comprised the bridge snapping in two, and the sound of a revolver being cocked. Hollings wheeled around, his left hand going to the bridge rail, his right hand groping for the flap which closed his gun into the holster. The Union boy whom Hollings had assumed had slipped into the stream was standing there, a big colt aimed straight for Hollings' chest. Hollings knew he had to move or die. He vaulted toward the Union soldier, the big boar Colt revolver discharging. Hollings feeling the bullet as it cracked just past his left ear. Hollings' right hand held the bowie knife and he stabbed it downward, the point biting flesh along the boy's back, then the blade flat skittering off over the shoulder blade. Hollings' left hand viced over the boy's Colt, the hammer falling with a loud click but biting into the fleshy web between Hollings' thumb and first finger, rather than striking the cap set into the nipple on the other side of the frame. He remembered something he'd first seen done when one of the servant boys he'd played with as a boy had gotten into a fight with a Cherokee. The Cherokee did it and nearly crippled little Ben, doubling him over. Hollings did it now, smashing his right knee upward into the Union boy's private parts. There was a rush of foul-smelling breath, and for an instant all the weight of the Union boy's colt was hanging from Hollings' flesh. Hollings rammed his knife inward, catching the enemy soldier under the ribcage, and there was a terrible howl. Flesh tore from the web of Hollings' hand as the boy fell against him. Hollings lost his balance, his right knee finally failing him, and he collapsed, the Union soldier's weight smothering him. They fell onto the bridge. Board split fell away. Hollings' upper body was hanging over the raging waters. The Union boy, blood streaming from his mouth, had his big Colt pistol in his right hand, twisting its muzzle towards Hollings' chest. Hollings swung his left fist up, hammering it into the middle of his opponent's face, the blow apparently stunning the Union soldier. The boy fell back, Hollings' knife still protruding from his left side. Hollings grabbed into a section of bridge flooring, more of the boards giving way beneath him as he clawed with his right hand for the flap of his holster. He had it, tore it open, his fingers closing over the butt of the revolver. The Union boy shouted, You've killed me, rebel! The Union boy and Hollings fired the revolvers in the same instant, the Colt's muzzle so close to Hollings' chest that in the next instant as Hollings lay there, his own revolver still smoking in his hand, he could not understand how the Union soldiers round missed him. It seemed impossible, but there was no pain. Hollings had not missed. One neat hole in the center of the Union boy's face, just at the very bridge of the nose, 
rain washing over wide open eyes. The bridge. The trembling of the bridge persisted, but for some reason Hollings no longer feared its collapse beneath him. He had survived this life and death encounter. He would survive the next, he knew. The rushing sound of the wind increased. The lightning was coming so rapidly now. The bright light from it was continuous. Preston Hollings stood up. Whatever he had done to his knee was better now because he could move it with ease. He looked down at his left hand where his flesh had stopped the colt's hammer from falling. There was a wound, but the bleeding had stopped and it no longer hurt. He nodded to himself. Rain rolled from the brim of his hat and crossed his face and he was momentarily surprised that his hat had not been lost during the fight. Preston Hollings holstered his gun, reminding himself to reload once he was across, and he started forward, picking each step, then both hands grasped to the right side rail. The light was gradually dimming. It wasn't that nice Mrs. Hubbard's face now, but the nurse's face again hovering above him, seeming to float there. Mr. Hollings, can you hear me? Blink your eyes if you can hear me. Mr. Hollings? Preston Hollings, can you hear me? Only a dead man couldn't have hurt her, Hollings thought. That night, the Union boy stopped hearing forever. Behind him, the very second that his feet touched the ground, the bridge collapsed into the raging river below it. The supports washed away like twigs, the bridge splitting right at the center, both halves of it falling into the water, while simultaneously great splashes, battering against one another for a moment, blocked the river's course itself. There were tearing sounds, popping noises, like small explosions and the bridge sections rose and snapped, then sank under the white frothed waters. Preston Holling stood there, shaking as he watched it. He drew his revolver, one shot remaining of the six. He would reload it beneath the shelter of one of the massive live oaks some yards distance, back from the swollen river course, killing men in battle when everyone around you was killing or being killed wasn't like it had been back on the other side of the bridge. That was personal, somehow more real, more terrifying. The mud was deep here, but he managed walking better than he had before, as soon he was beneath one of the trees. The lightning persisted, but not coming so rapidly now, and the cacophonous rumble of thunder was louder here. As a boy, every time there was a storm, someone would always warn him not to hide from it under a tree, because trees seemed to attract lightning. Oaks, worst of all, but he would only be a moment then on his way again. From beneath his clothes, he untied a small sack with his spare cartridges, opened it, removed five, reclosed and secured the precious ammunition again. Carefully, he broke open his revolver, waiting for the light of a lightning flash. He discarded the spent cases, putting five fresh with the one remaining from before. Then he closed the action. A fully loaded gun. He felt better now although six thirty-two rim fires would do little against a Union force if this side of the river were in the enemy hands as well. Tempus Fuji, he reminded himself aloud, having totally lost track of just what time it was. He took his watch, the one given him when he went off to study medicine from his pocket. He opened the case and in a flash of lightning could see the face right enough. The hands seemed not to have moved. He held the watch to his ear, but could hear no ticking. Yet it was fully wound, just as before. Clearly the watch had been damaged during the fight. Hollings put the watch away carefully. Some day, when this war was over, he might be able to find someone who could restore it. He marched away from the trees, the rain falling more heavily than before. It seemed, yet probably because of his exertion at the bridge, it no longer chilled him. As best he could judge, he made good time, moving briskly, along a steep hillside, but at a diagonal minimizing the effort needed to reach the top. The body, his professors had told him, had a remarkable way at times of rising beyond its normal capabilities. Men, and sometimes women, had been known to perform near Herculean feats of strength during a crisis situation, which under normal circumstances would have been impossible for them. Such was the case now, he realized, but such added vigor would ebb quickly and he must find help as rapidly as circumstances allowed. Hollings attained the crest of the hill, and there was stretching before him the carriage road he had expected. To the west there should be a settlement. Westerly, up the course of the river, there was a small falls, and logic dictated 
that a grist mill would be set there to utilize the natural force of the water. Where there was a mill, there was usually a town nearby. To the east, he was uncertain how many miles might needed to be traveled. It was possible, even likely, that if help were not immediately available, he could find a telegraph and send word somehow for help. To the west it was, and he turned right, starting down the carriage road. The trees on either side of the road rose high and were densely clustered, the result being that the road was in almost total blackness, little illumination from the still persistent lightning flashes able to penetrate the foliage. But the rain was also less forceful beneath this natural shelter, and the surface of the road beneath his feet seemed admirably firm. He was able to walk even faster than before, his steps not seeming to tire him at all. Hollings walked on that way for some considerable time, his pace as fast as prudence dictated. The road rose, following the natural contour of the terrain. Hollings supposing that he had to be near to the likely mill site, he quickened his pace in anticipation. At the crest, however, he stopped. To his left, towards the south, well beyond a wall of the same trees which had sheltered him all along, Hollings saw light. A farmhouse? If this were the light from a farmhouse, he might be able to borrow a horse or even a mule, and he could travel faster still. The source of the light did not appear to be terribly far beyond the trees, so he left the road, making his way toward it. At once, as soon as he left the protective canopy, the rain returned in its full intensity, and he pushed his hat down lower and hunched his shoulders higher against it, marching on. The ground was not only less uniform than the road, but rougher still than the hillside he had originally mounted in order to reach the road. At one point, wild grasses reaching nearly to his waist, he put his foot into a hole and nearly fell. But he didn't twist anything. He pressed on toward the light, a glow which seemed somehow to be floating in the middle of the night. Hollings held his pistol more tightly. The terrain he traversed quite suddenly began to rise, and he followed its topography upward toward the light. He realized with some considerable relief that the light source did not float at all, but merely appeared to do so because it was situated on higher ground, and the otherwise total blackness, the lightning had now ceased, did not allow the eyes to distinguish features. As he neared the source of the light, he was better able to discern its specific nature. It was some sort of a bonfire. The fire burned so brightly, he deduced, because the logs which served it were immense, Fell trees dragged to one single location for one purpose only. It was an old woodsman's trick to lay a single tree trunk into a fire, and as the night progressed and the fire devoured the wood, merely forced the log deeper into the flames, feeding them. But this fire carried that practice to the extreme. As he came closer still to it, he could see at least six such massive logs set around the blaze, much like spokes were set in a wheel about a central hub and he flexed his fingers on the grip of his revolver, because he saw men huddled around the fire, the silhouettes of arms, rifles some fixed with bayonets outlined against the blaze. There were other shapes at the boundary circumscribed by the light, monoliths with squared off or rounded tops, oddly defined figures, crosses too. He realized what these were as he nearly fell over one of them. They were headstones, and this was a cemetery. A curiously formal voice called out to him from the darkness, challenging, Halt! Who goes there, friend or foe? Some of the silhouettes moved against the firelight. For a moment Hollings was dumbstruck as to the wording of his reply. At last, however, he called back, First Lieutenant Preston W. Hollings, 10th Georgia Militia. If these were Union boys, his fate was sealed. He readied his revolver. But a voice, formal sounding but different from the first in both accent and modulation, called out to him, this time emanating from near the fire. Approach, Lieutenant, and put away your pistol. Whoever the speaker was had keen eyesight, because by contrast to the light from the fire where he stood was as black as pitch. Hollings eased down the hammer of his revolver, holstered it, but did not close the flap in the event he might require quick access to this, his only weapon. He walked toward the fire, and as he did, the silhouette seemed to grow, not in size, but dimension with form and substance beyond what he had seen before. Some of them, who had apparently been sitting on headstones near to the flames, rose, and one of them taller than the others approached him. 
meeting him by the boundary between the darkness and the light. The voice, cultured, sounding, confident, and resonant, was the same voice which had welcomed him to this company. And what are you doing here this night, lad? Hollings had not been called lad for many years, but he answered, saluting, as he said, I am on a mission of grave importance for my commander, sir, Captain Amos Colton Sturette. Perhaps you all heard of him, sir. The salute was returned. I regret that I have not. But of what brings you here this night is of grave importance, lad, and surely you have come to the right place. And one hand made a sweeping gesture towards the headstone surrounding them. There was laughter, hearty laugh from the persons still beside the fire. This is no joking matter, I assure you all, sir. The boys are cut off by the river, the only road being one which has been overrun by Union forces. If the rain stops tonight, or when the sun rises, regardless of the rain, the enemy forces will sweep down on our encampment. We have very few men, sir, only eight horses, no field pieces, and several boys who are seriously wounded. I find your use of the word enemy very interesting, lad. Come and warm yourself by the fire, and then you can ask me what it is you want to ask me. But only then. He moved away. Hollings followed him, still not quite certain that this was not a Union force. The speech pattern of the man, not at all like anything he had ever heard in the South, but not quite northern either. As Hollings neared the bright center of the firelight, he could see most of the others quite clearly. A more raggedly uniformed group would have been hard to imagine. Some of the clothes all but tatters, and no rhyme or reason to them either. Much the same could be said for the weapons, too. Guns of such widely ranging age and description as to defy an arms historian. There were Gallagher's, Burnside's, Enfield's, but older pieces as well. Long rifles of the kind one only saw in these days hung with a powder horn above a fireboard, both percussion and flintlock. He sat down by the fire, feeling as though he were desecrating some dead person's memory by using a tombstone thusly, but keenly desirous not to offend this strange band. Perhaps they were irregulars. There were such units often operating in civilian clothing or mixed uniform parts, using hit-and-run tactics against Union supply trains and the like. Once seated, Hollings noticed that nowhere was there sign of any food or drink. These soldiers seemed almost in worse straits than the tenth. There was something you wished to ask me, lad? Hollings could see his host quite clearly now by the firelight. The man's uniform was Tuscaloosa gray, but there was no black piping. His badge of rank, set on the open high collar of the garment, showed him to be a colonel. But the design was unique. The man had hair nearly as long as a woman's, well past his shoulders, but pushed back from his face, dark and full beneath a broad-brimmed, equally dark hat with a low crown, a plume, somewhat bedraggled with the rain, rising from the left side of the headband. The hat was cocked low over his right eye, and his left eye was covered by a black patch. One finger touched the patch, then the hand drifted over his massive chest to rest on his thigh. Two cult army models of 1860 were thrust into the broad belt at his waist, the holster for a smaller revolver of some sort suspended at his right side, a knife nearly the size of a Roman short sword at his left hip. Hollings was drawn back to the face, leaned to the point of haggard, but the good eye, and the firelight to tell a color would have been impossible, it was almost inky in its blackness, and seemed keen enough, following Hollings' eyes. It was hard for Preston Hollings to draw his gaze from that eye, to break its hold, but with considerable effort he turned his attention briefly to the other men, all of their faces visible except for that of a bulky man sitting on the opposite side of the fire, head bent down, the flames between them a barricade denying closer scrutiny. Your question, Lieutenant Hollings. Sir, I request the aid of y'all, y'all's men, in order that a counterattack might be launched against that portion of the Union force which denies the Tenth access to the road, the only route to survival. Surely there must be means by which this wild river to the north can be crossed. We can double back, striking unexpectedly against their weak flank. They will fall back to reorganize, Hollings continued. My captain will move the men out before the Union forces can rally against y'all's unit. Y'all can withdraw then. 
Captain Sturette will be able to block Union access along the road through the use of one remaining gunpowder, and in so doing securing our line of withdrawal. As all swift interdiction is the tent's only chance, sir. We have been fighting for a very long time, Lieutenant Hollings. Longer, I dare say, than any soldiers you have ever encountered. Hollings would not dispute such a statement. These men looked every word of it, and then some. Sir, I appeal to y'all's sense of decency. And what will you do, lad, if you can find no help? Hollings felt an emptiness, and stood as he said, Failing that, help can be found, sir. I shall rejoin Captain Sturette and the men, fighting beside them against the enemy as long as breath remains to me. Fine sentiments, lad. Use that word again, a word which I find curious in great measure. Describe for me this enemy. The Union soldiers, sir. Are they not men like you? Certainly, but they fight against us. Then you hold no personal animosity toward this enemy. Hollings shook his head. That is war, sir. Under other circumstances, who is to know these Union boys might not be friends, or you all the enemy? At this the colonel laughed heartily. Hollings was about to take offense, but the colonel's laughter abruptly ceased, and he said, We will march with you, lieutenant, because the answer you gave was the only correct answer. And the colonel looked skyward into the night. But we will have to move quickly. He stood up taller, seeming now, or perhaps it was just that Preston Hollings had not taken notice of his height before. In a loud, command voice, those men still seated around the fire, rising at his words, those already standing stepped forward, all taking up their motley collection of arms. The colonel ordered, It is time to fall in, lads. There is bloody work to do this night. Hollings had not realized that so many men were encamped here, the soldiers ranking themselves into two files, the rear of each file extending so far back into the darkness that Hollings could not clearly discern any approximation of their numbers. The colonel turned towards Hollings, bidding him, March beside me, lad. Hollings fell in. As if some silent command had been given, they moved out, the silence total except for the noise of the rain and the thrumming of boots on muddy ground and the rattling of saber chains and rifle slings. Mr. Hollings is not responding, Dr. Carew. Let's see if we can rally him, Mr. Hollings. What's his first name? Preston. He used to be a lieutenant in the war between the states. Right, Mr. Um, Lieutenant Hollings, we need you to respond, sir. Lieutenant Hollings, can you hear me at all? His pulse is erratic, doctor. The heart. The old strong ones like this fellow. It's usually the heart. Preston Hollings wanted to tell them that they were right, but it was as if a fist were tightening and twisting inside his chest, and he didn't have the breath to form the words. There were shoals above the falls which powered the grist mill. Under normal conditions, the water here would have been mere inches deep. Hollings realized so gentle that its current would hardly have been noticeable. To cross it, you would jump from one flat rock to another, careful to mind the footing, lest a misstep should cause a slip and a douse your boots in a shallow pool. This night, however, as they linked hands to keep each other upright, the water rose to Hollings' thigh and tore at his balance, trying to catch him off guard for the slightest second, drag him along in its raging current, pull him over the edge and into the falls and down to his death. The colonel walked at their head, with such apparent ease, however, that the pace and force of the water seemed not to affect him, and curiously Hollings' own movement required less effort than he would have supposed. Both the colonel and the man behind Hollings had hands even colder than Hollings' own, and he knew that he and all of the colonel's men should be chilled to the bone by now. Yet he was not, nor did anyone else evince that condition. These men were battle-hardened. The colonel, to Hollings' thinking, was of indeterminate age, but moved with the agility of a boy, scrambling up the embankment. Hollings, hard-pressed to keep from falling behind, Hollings looked back across the river, but he still could not see where the column ended. You have a sizable force, sir. Yes, indeed, lad. And there was a note of something like sadness in that sonorous voice. The ranks grow even as we speak. 
and the colonel's pace quickened now. Rapid pulse, erratic, labored breathing, were losing him. There was a perfectly good reason for heavy breathing, of course, and he wanted to tell them that, but the fist that clenched within his chest would not allow it, was in fact closing tighter. They marched to the east. Hollings wished that his watch still functioned, because he was certain every time that he looked horizonward that the sun would be there, and he had lost all track of time. They marched on, the physical appearance of the colonel's men belying their freshness, their fitness. Not only did no man break ranks, not a one broke step, albeit the pace was a killing one. Then the colonel stopped. The Union lines are there, and he looked toward the north. Hollings stared into the darkness. He could see nothing. The colonel's words were not a question. It seemed but more a statement of obvious fact. Where, sir? The colonel looked at him, the rain falling so intensely that Hollings could barely discern the colonel's outline. A gun emplacement. Rather hastily dug, it would appear, five hundred yards, just at the edge of a stand of white pine. From that point, as an apex, the Union lines extend both southeasterly and northeasterly. The obvious object of the position is to allow your lads access to the road, then close in behind them, the numbers pursuing them increasing, the more deeply the road is penetrated. Midway along the southeasterly tangent there is cavalry. When your lads have reached the point one hundred yards up, the road along which we travel the artillery will saturate the road. With your lads stalled, the cavalry will swoop down, driving them into the woods there. And the colonel pointed to his right, to the south. There's infantry position in those woods. Nothing your lads could not handle if they did not have a cavalry unit at their heels. To neutralize the situation, we must first silence that gun before it speaks, then cause the cavalry to withdraw. Once your lads have reached this point, if they are unmolested by the gun, the infantry hidden in these woods will not dare attack. Your lads will escape with their lives for now. Hollings just stared, wishing he could see the solitary eye, and perhaps through it some insight into the strange man's tactical genius. Do you choose to fight with us for now or return to your unit? At this point you have the choice. Choose wisely. I will fight with you all, sir, to make certain that all goes as planned, begging the colonel's pardon. Then I will be able to rejoin my unit as they pass. The wise choice, lad. Stay close. And the colonel turned away. Without a sound from his lips, he merely gestured, and about two dozen of his company fell out from one column, starting up the rise toward the gun position. The colonel raised his right hand, his sword clenched there, then pointed the blade in the direction where he had said the cavalry was lying in wait. Sir? Hollings. Are we? We must attack the cavalry, but we will drive them back. Follow me. They began to move at a slight tangent to the road just above it, towards a darker darkness that Hollings assumed would be a tree line. He would keep his cavalry there. The Smith and Wesson was in his hand, without his consciously drawing it, right elbow tight to his side. The rain fell unremittingly, relentlessly, but he was past cold. He felt nothing except a thrill that was not physical, welling up inside of him. Captain Sturette would hear the shots, would rouse the boys and start them out along the road. The other seven men on horseback, keeping to the north side of the road in a posture for instant defense from a cavalry strike, the wounded well to the center of the column. They neared the darker darkness, and it was a tree lined. None of the others of the company brandished weapons. What a well-trained lot, he thought. Hollings strode beside and a pace behind the colonel. He noticed the large man he had seen across the fire in a cemetery encampment fall into his immediate left. In the darkness, he could see no face, evidently a senior non-commissioned officer, prepared to fight and die at his commander's side, or perhaps aid a first lieutenant in staying out of trouble, and Hollings thought of Tom Rollins, platoon sergeant extraordinaire, a soldier's soldier, but a farmer, a husband, and a father a few short years ago. The pace quickened, the tree line less than fifty yards off now. Still no repositioning of weapons, still no orders. These men had to be regulars, despite their uniforms, the discipline unlike anything Hollings had ever experienced. Despite the pace, they were at full run now. The step was not broken. Into the trees, horses picketed there but fully tacked, 
a rifle shot. This would start it, yet there was no shot, no sound from the men who now surrounded him. Hollings raised his revolver, making to fire at a Union soldier visible in the flash of a rifle, but Hollings could not take the shot with no clear field of fire, the colonel's men blocking him. Hollings ran on. Gunfire was general now. Horses and men fled from the onslaught. Rifles and pistols were fired, but none by the colonel's men. They ran in perfect step. A wall of Union soldiers, cavalrymen afoot, pistols were fired, sabers brandished. The wall crumbled. Hollings could get no clear field of fire. Behind them and to the north, Hollings heard the sound of an explosion, not a gun being fired, but spiked instead. He had heard that sound early that day, when he and Rollins had destroyed the field piece which had to be left behind. In perfect step, the colonel's men ran forward. A line of riflemen, a volley of Union fire, the flashes blindingly bright against the darkness. Lieutenant Hollings, this is Dr. Carew. Blink if you can hear me. Hollings looked up. His eyelids did not want to close, despite the brightness. They ran on. The Union boys were in a rout. Then the burly sergeant beside Preston Hollings turned to face him. Perhaps there was a lightning flash. But regardless, Hollings could see the face clearly. Unmistakably, the face was that of Tom Rollins. Lieutenant Hollings, sir, it is time for you all to rejoin Captain Sturette. The running had ceased, and they all stood there. Hollings walled in by the colonel's men. All gunfire had ended, and the wind-driven rain no longer lashed Hollings' face. Tom, you all are dead. Yes, sir. With all respect, sir, you all must rejoin the boys, sir. It is now or never, sir. Hollings stared. He could feel the wall of soldiers which was surrounding him opening to give him passage. Tom, hurry, Lieutenant. Tom, it is now or never, sir. Tom, I, Lieutenant, do not you all think I know? Come back with me, Tom. I cannot obey you all's order, sir, even if I wished. We, we will fight together another day, sir. Hollings could not feel himself moving, but Tom Rawlings and the colonel and the colonel's men were moving away from him. Their image, now like something seen when looking through the wrong end of a telescope, growing more distant by the instant. There was gunfire, more thunderous than before. The colonel's men began to run again, charging to the guns. The shroud of the night closed around them, covered them darkness everywhere. Preston Hollings closed his eyes against it. He opened his eyes. He saw the river of wild white froth careening beneath him. Above him darkness and a face. Press, speak to me, press. The face was that of Captain Sturette. There was a terrible pain in Preston Hollings' chest. He looked down across his body. His right hand held his revolver, was clenched over his chest in the light of a torch held in Captain Sturette's hand. Hollings could see that the hand which held the Smith & Wesson was bathed in blood. Captain, I sent the men on a head press. There's a force attacking the Union flank. I do not know how you all did it. God, you could not have done it because you are here. But you all must have. Preston Hollings looked his right. The bridge was gone. He was on the side of the river where he had started. I came back for you all thinking there was something wrong. Tom, Tom Rollins, run through the backbone with a bayonet by a damn blue belly boy. Captain Sturette's hand reached out to him. Hands touched his face. He could feel that. The doctor and the nurse were trying to be kind, he knew, trying to close his eyes against the light. But the light did not go away. It became only brighter and now there was something visible in the light far away, but coming closer by the second than suddenly there. It was the colonel's eye. I missed you at roll call, lad. That night, when first we met, and later when Jim Bodkin took that suero instead of you, and again on that hill in Cuba when the bullet missed the artery in your leg. Are you ready now? Preston Hollings looked down across his body. Both legs were there. His stomach was flat, and his holster was the old thirty-two rimfire, and his uniform was Confederate gray. Thousands of faces were ranked beneath the colonel, in column of twos going on it seemed forever. Somewhere near the rear he saw the soldier who died of bad lungs from the gas in the 
trenches in France, saw the Union boy who had shot him through the left breast beside the bridge he never crossed that night in 1864. The Sioux warrior was there too, proud and defiant, wore bonnet fresh, wore paint gleaming. Hey, Reb! To his left stood Jim Bodkin. Welcome, sir. Preston Hollings looked to his right. Tom Rollins. I told you all, Lieutenant, we would fight together again. The Colonel Sh ordered, It is time to fall in, lads. There is bloody work to do this night. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called upon yonder, I'll be there. James and Black. <laughs>